Today we have a very special guest. Professor Adel Malek is one of the American leaders in endovascular and open vascular neurosurgery. He heads the cerebrovascular and endovascular division in the Department of Neurosurgery at Tufts in Boston. He did residency at Brigham and Women's Children's Hospital at Boston and a neurointerventional radiology fellowship at the UCSF. He conducts research at the Malek Cerebrovascular Research Lab, which concentrates in computational cerebral hemodynamic studies and also in the development of software tools for next generation smart angiography, which is pretty interesting to me and deserves a separate discussion. Finally, he co-invented along with Dr. Carl Hellman, the Ishant, which was developed by Cervasc as the first endovascular, purely endovascular device for communicating hydrocephalus. So it's a pleasure for us to have you, Dr. Malik. Thank you very much for joining us and you can share your screen. Thank you very much, uh, Matthias, for the introduction. I really appreciate uh, the ability to share uh, with everyone uh, some of our recent work. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to see uh, Cameron again. Um, and uh, again, an honor to, to be able to give you uh, this talk. So uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of our um, uh, journey to uh, developing the uh, uh, Ishant and the Vasco Shant and some of our preliminary uh, results. Uh, uh, these are my disclosures. Um, uh, this has really been a team effort with uh, my uh, close colleague and friend, uh, Carl Heilman, um, for the last 11 years. You know, as you know, uh, Carl is a, a skull based uh, neurosurgeon, <clears throat> and uh, he actually has a link to uh, endovascular. Uh, uh, kind of uh, coiling from the very beginning. I think he did some of the early experiments um, back when he was uh, a, a resident uh, here at Tufts. Um, and his father-in-law uh, is uh, Chuck Gerber, who's, uh, you know, very dear to all of us uh, and one of the forefathers of, of the field. Um, and so uh, he's always been interested in kind of endovascular tools and uh, been very supportive in uh, developing um, you know, endovascular treatment of uh, aneurysms early on uh, when I first started uh, here uh, in, in the program in 2001. Um, you know, um, as we kind of took away the pleasure of uh, microsurgical clipping uh, away from, um, you know, the open microsurgeons um, and uh, replaced it with one of the variety of tools for treatment of aneurysms, your stent coiling of this ACOM aneurysm, uh, they ha have been also an interest in uh, kind of giving us some of the non-savory uh, procedures uh, of neurosurgery, namely uh, VP shunt uh, surgery. Um, as you know from uh, practice, um, VP shunt, although uh, a, a critical uh, aspect uh, and treatment uh, for uh, neurosurgeons and, and the patients, is, is really fraught with uh, multiple complications, a lot of time which we seem to uh, accept. Um, and, you know, these can include over drainage, as you can see here, uh, with formation of subdurals, uh, catheter malposition, um, and uh, related hematomas from the insertion in patients that may be on anticoagulants or uh, antiplatelet therapy. It's an old procedure um, that uh, uh, still has uh, complications, um, both on intracranially. This is a case of uh, kind of collapsed ventricles around the catheter. And when this catheter comes back with uh, malfunction, it's always a challenge to replace it. Or, of course, with uh, uh, distal malfunction, uh, you know, whether it's uh, a catheter in the preperitoneal fat or um, an infection um, and so really there have been very few uh, improvements uh, in the rate of shunt malfunction, uh, despite uh, multiple advancements such as adjustable valves and uh, antibiotic impregnated catheters. Uh, we still have a shunt malfunction rate of close to 40%. Uh, and of course this varies from institution to institution. Um, but uh, we kind of uh, thought, is there a way that's less invasive for treating communicating hydrocephalus? And this is really the impetus. Uh, we thought it would be great to be able to have a biomimetic solution, one that would actually um, 
kind of really uh, be similar to the arachnoid granulation, which is a passive filter uh, of uh, cerebrospinal fluid uh, from the subarachnoid space uh, into the venous system. And so our initial examination was, you know, looking at the proximity of the sigmoid sinus, transverse sinus, and the subarachnoid space. And the thought is, could we develop a device that could bridge this um, gap and uh, potentially enable us, you know, to um, implant a, uh, an equivalent of an arachnoid granulation? Uh, venous stenting, which uh, has obviously become um, pretty much uh, a standard procedure and nowadays was, uh, you know, has been increasing. Uh, and uh, its facility, thanks to uh, advanced gut catheters and intermediate catheters, is much simpler than, than it was uh, back 20 years ago. You know, uh, it's uh, now possible to treat patients with idiopathic intracranial hypertension from venous sinus stenosis with stent angioplasty and, uh, and stent deployment. This was our uh, original um, kind of patent that we applied for. It was very primitive, as you can see. It entailed using perhaps some kind of a screw device that we could kind of cork into the subarachnoid space and then would basically be flowing into the sinus. Uh, we thought of maybe having a balloon that would uh, not occlude flow, but would stabilize a uh, angled catheter that would enable placement of this uh, system. Um, and uh, this patent was initially rejected. Uh, um, Colin and I had to uh, fly down to Washington, D.C. and meet with the examiner, and then eventually they understood the concept and the novelty, and um, it was granted. But it was very difficult to develop this because uh, we had no funds internally for startup uh, ideas. Uh, externally, we uh, pitched the idea to a couple of venture capital firms, and there really was no interest. There was a very um, kind of a um, a bit of a far-fetched idea. And we also applied to the Mass Life Science Innovation Grant uh, with Covidian uh, after having talks um, with them through the medical center. Um, and um, this is the response that we got, uh, which is that, hey, we like you guys, uh, you know, you're great, uh, both of you, but um, although it's an innovative concept, it's overly ambitious and unlikely to succeed and um, we had no data back then. Um, and so even though the uh, grant was for innovative, innovative ideas, uh, they thought it was just way out there and uh, they were looking for something more of an evolutionary advance than something that could potentially be disruptive. So um, we kind of were very frustrated and it kind of uh, laid on the, after, on, the, on the back burner for about a, a year or so. Uh, luckily, um, a, a pair of uh, venture capitalists, uh, Dan Levangi and Pat Sullivan. Uh, Dan had actually uh, been involved in um, as uh, being on the board of uh, Covidian or EV3 uh, for actually acquiring a, a Chestnut Medical and the pipeline device um, and was uh, interested in one of the patents we had um, kind of submitted uh, and obtained for a flow diverting uh, stent, which could effectively deflect the flow away from, from an aneurysm. And uh, as he, they were interested in this, uh, we actually got the approval for the uh, shunt patent and uh, they um, saw the value of uh, something that was kind of disruptive uh, and luckily were able to finally get a startup. Uh, this was the formation in 2014 of Cerevasc. Um, and that kind of finally enabled us to start um, the process of ideation of how do we uh, bridge the gap between uh, the subarachnoid space, the cisterns, and the venous system. Uh, you know, it entailed cadaveric quark, some 3D printing, um, you know, uh, finding a drill a substitute, uh, a drill matrix, if you will, that could kind of enable us to um, place the device across. Uh, this is actually a chicken skin. I got it from Chinatown and I'm using an enterprise stent with a bipolar here uh, with a monopolar to see if we can actually puncture it. So a lot of different ideas. Um, and uh, that also led to uh, different models. Uh, this is a nitinol um, device that we thought initially would be useful. Um, we did uh, many experiments in, in swine and pig trying to see if we could uh, actually have the equivalent of a venous system. Um, 
And uh, unfortunately, none of these animal models were, were suitable or, or equivalent to the human anatomy. So then the question was, can we mimic the arachnoid granulation function using an endovascular device? And I think the real uh, breakthrough in the approach uh, feasibility came when um, it was recognized that the inferior petrosal sinus would be an excellent location for a device of this nature. Namely, the IPS is uh, routinely accessed by neurointerventionalists and endovascular neurosurgeons for petrosal sinus sampling or treatment of carotid cavernous fistulae. And um, it is one which is uh, right next to the cerebral pontian angle cistern, providing for potential a controlled space. Um, and the fact that, um, God forbid, if it should be sacrificed, inferior petrosal sinus is uh, less likely to cause a neurological uh, problem than um, uh, injuring or compromising uh, one of the major uh, sinuses, uh, such as the transfer sigmoid sinus. The other benefit of the inferior petrosal sinus is uh, the fact that it's encased in bone. Uh, and as a result, uh, it's um, very uh, much possible to then have control of the device without having any movement of the target as would be in a, in a vein or an artery, which is compliant. Um, and uh, the dura overlying the sinus is kind of a drum-like, so it would be very uh, feasible to um, uh, transgress and um, if you will, puncture it or uh, access across of it in a controlled fashion. Uh, this is just a, uh, you know, a CC fistula treated here with uh, twin microcatheters because there were kind of two different, uh, you know, approaches just illustrating. I'm sure you have many of these cases. Uh, the fact that uh, it's an accessible transvenous uh, uh, location. Uh, our first work, um, try to characterize the anatomy, namely what is the size of the inferior petrosal sinus? Can we get a device to travel into the IPS? Um, you know, can, are we able to maneuver something that is a four French in diameter? And what is the uh, distance and depth of the um, cerebral uh, pontine angle cistern uh, at that site? And so we actually uh, took a number of uh, MRIs that had been done um, uh, for trigeminal neuralgia patients uh, and retrospectively reviewed them, uh, you know, along multiple uh, age groups um, and um, basically measured the uh, diameter of the IPS using uh, multiplanar reconstruction, measured the depth of the CP angle cistern and the distance from the uh, IPS to the vertebral artery. And uh, this was a study that was published in JNS a few years back that shows that the, there is enough uh, space, although the space does increase with age, as we expect, um, and that the actual diameter of the inferior petrosal sinus uh, should be uh, overall greater than um, two millimeters and should enable passage of a device. Our initial um, modeling in, you know, uh, weighed heavily on using a 19 l device that perhaps could stretch to different uh, lengths, depending on the anatomy and the site of uh, deployment, however, these proved to be um, thrombogenic uh, in flow loops. And so our final design um, actually is very simple. Uh, it has a stent anchor, which is called a malacot, which uh, basically uh, what's deployed opens up and enables uh, the eshant not to be pulled out of its location. So that uh, this would be the inflow zone in the CP angle cistern. The shunt body would be residing in the inferior petrosal sinus, and there's a slit valve that would prevent backflow of blood into the um, uh, shunt itself. <clears throat> and the idea is uh, uh, I'm sure you've seen whenever uh, patients have an EVD in place and they bear down or ha either having a bowel movement or coughing, the ICP will uh, the spike you know, up in the uh, you know, 30. Um, millimeters of mercury or higher, uh, and the slit valve, although both the CSF and the venous pressure usually travel together, uh, should prevent any uh, transient dynamic changes. <clears throat> this is the actual device um, held in uh, uh, Carl's fingers here. And so this will be in the CP angle cistern and the body of the shunt, and this is the valve right here. Uh, as you can see, this is just a flow uh, of a blue dye under pressure through the valve. 
And uh, many testing uh, was done uh, measuring forward flow and back flow. And really we're targeting what would be the equivalent of you know, ventricular drain in one of our patients uh, around 10 um, you know, mLs per hour <clears throat> uh, when we're encountering you know, pressure differential of about 10 centimeters of water. Uh, this is the backflow showing uh, that even when you have a high pressure of 37 millimeters of mercury, it is negligible backflow, uh, even uh, over hours. So we would never expect that to happen. So our next step is the whole issue of can we actually transgress through a sinus and get into the, vena, uh, into the cistern uh, without causing a hemorrhage? And uh, surprisingly, uh, you know, using um, effectively a sheep model, uh, we found that you can actually go through the vein and into the um, cerebellar cistern here without inducing uh, hemorrhage in the, um, um, in the uh, arachnoid, subarachnoid space. And, you know, you think, how is that possible? Well, it kind of is counterintuitive. A lot of us have had intraprocedural rupture while calling aneurysms, and it's usually, uh, you know, hyper-emergency and, and uh, very uh, kind of uh, stressful. Um, but in this case, the CSF pressure is actually higher than the venous pressure, so the gradient is in the opposite direction. And um, we actually were able to uh, perform this in a number of sheep without having any evidence of, of, uh, of bleeding on CT scan after accessing the cerebellar cistern. This is the actual tubing. And although the uh, ID is very small, it's around 0165, so pretty much like a typical microcatheter uh, for aneurysm coiling. Uh, the distance is very short compared to our VP shunt tubing. And so the resistance is actually pretty low and you actually get very good flow. So then the question is, how do we deliver this miniature shunt device transdurally during an endovascular approach? And this is where it became a challenge to try to figure out the technique of how do we get it in position, and also how do we uh, get the imaging pipeline, if you will, the workflow to enable this to happen in, in patients. Uh, we characterize the IPS anatomy and the adjacent CP angle cistern, a number of patients, the 3D printing models, and uh, uh, did some uh, uh, testing and kind of brainstorming. And <clears throat> really the idea came to uh, use a anchor, where basically we would catheterize the uh, IPS and the cavernous sinus, uh, drop a stent-like device uh, or stent retriever, if you will, um, one that would actually have a flat rail. And a flat rail is effectively not a round wire, but a flat wire. And the reason to use a flat rail, initially we uh, felt that it could help orient the device in the correct direction. But the other advantage is it actually lowers the profile of the device itself and enables it to remain very small. And it provides with a uh, effectively a rail that we can use with the rapid exchange uh, microcatheter device. This is a delivery catheter, it's rapid exchange. It will glide over the flat rail and it has a needle that is protected by a guard. When it's in position, we unsheath the needle and then the vector becomes straight because of that angle uh, angulation that you see in the IPS. And that angulation is exactly the site where we uh, exit the into the CP angle cistern. This is the design of the delivery catheter. You can see the needle and it's protected by this needle guard. The flat trail enters through here and exits uh, on the back. Um, and effectively when you're in position, this whole segment unsheathed to the back exposes the needle, which then is uh, carefully advanced into the CP angle cistern. The eShunt is actually preloaded in the, uh, uh, in the, with inside the needle and is ensconced by a, a micro stent called the shroud. So effectively you have complete control of the eShunt during the delivery process. One of the uh, safety features is the fact that the flat rail, because it will be in the IPS, and because we can determine the depth between this point and the needle, uh, sets a maximal uh, depth that the device could uh, enter into the CP angle uh, cistern to prevent, uh, you know, uh, ham-handed operators, unfortunately, from um, over uh, penetration into the uh, CP angle cistern. 
So this is the final intended target. And I just want to show you this illustration that just shows how the device would be inserted. This is using a six French guide catheter. We go up with a 027 micro catheter, deploy the stent anchor, um, and then now advance the delivery catheter over that flat rail. Once in position, we unsheath and advance. We then advance the ishant and pull out the malacut remains within the CP angle cistern. We then go back up and retrieve the stent anchor device and come out and pull out everything. This is all done transvenously. From a transformal approach, it could be obviously done from um, a brachial approach or even a, a juggler approach. So our next uh, step was to actually test this in uh, frozen human cadaver heads. Um, and these were obtained by uh, volunteers that um, obviously had the will to um, participate in, in research, medical research after their passing uh, and were returned back uh, to the facility in, in Memphis for, uh, for proper burial afterwards. Um, so the, the, the skulls were actually uh, thawed, fixed in the Lexel head holder, and this was done in the Angel Suite. Uh, we cannulated the uh, IJ with a six French sheet and uh, obtained a 3D uh, rotational angiography and comb beam CT angiography. This is uh, highly reliant on three dimensional imaging, at least in this step. Uh, this is all work that was done um, after hours at Tufts. And so after getting into the micro uh, catheter in the cavernous sinus, we obtain a uh, three-dimensional angiogram through the micro catheter or comb beam CT. Um, and the idea is to leverage the use of 3D road mapping. <clears throat> 3D road mapping really became available uh, back in the early 2000s, maybe 2005 or so, um, with the increased use of 3D uh, rotational angiography, which really hadn't been that common uh, before 2000. Um, and uh, the idea between uh, behind 3D road mapping is you're able to overlay the 3D model onto uh, fluorography. I have never really found it useful in my practice in uh, treating aneurysms or, or other vascular lesion, but this is perfect for this application. And the concept is once we identify the area where we would like the device to be deployed, we can actually cut that in the model and then transfer that over uh, to the fluoroscopy so that as we move, the uh, projection, um, the spot will remain fixed in 3D space. And so the concept is we're able to uh, deploy the stent anchor that you see over here. This is the uh, target site that we want to exit. Uh, after we uh, unsheath the needle, we simply advance and we can see the needle exiting the IPS. As you see the at orange part is portion of the IPS that we simply cut off as the target site. This is what the needle looks like in the cadaver. Uh, and on the comb beam CT, you see the flat trail is going all the way up with the stand anchor up in the cavernous sinus. And this is after deployment of the device. This is the malacot. And then uh, as you can see, uh, it's deployed just outside the target site. Uh, this is uh, what the device looks like. Um, and uh, it's uh, uh, really going to leverage uh, kind of this uh, 3D road mapping technique. Uh, excuse me one second. And so how do we uh, do pre-procedural imaging? You know, um, this is now an endovascular uh, procedure. And so, you know, the same care that goes into coiling a two millimeter uh, aneurysm uh, has to go into this. Uh, you have to, unlike a, a, a VP shunt where you're like assuming, okay, Gajar principle, standard landmarks, Coker's point, and so on, and then you basically uh, measure and then go orthogonal and you're going to hit the ventricle. This is going to require more careful uh, pre you know, uh, pretreatment planning. Um, so um, using uh, an MR uh, imaging, an MRI with uh, T1 with gadolinium, uh, you basically want to look and see what is the distance between the IPS and the vasculature uh, and the brainstem. So on this side, we have one centimeter, uh, 11 millimeter of distance um, on, on the right side, and that's fine. Uh, but on the left side, you can see the vertebral artery swings right next to the exit of uh, the IPS and target. And so obviously this would not be um, a, a target. So the left side here would not be indicated for um, placement of the shunt. So you want to leverage uh, 
home BBCT or through the rotational angiography to um, uh, kind of uh, fuse potentially with uh, MR imaging for planning. And some of these may be overkill and uh, over requirement over time, but that's kind of uh, the level of detail that we are uh, following at this point. So uh, we're just gonna see what is the workflow. Uh, we get it with a microcatheter. We do the uh, injection through the microcatheter. We cut out the site uh, that we wanna target as the exit point, which is again at the point where the IPS has that angulation. You can see the 3D roadmap. Uh, as we move, uh, we kind of remain in, in the ideal location. This is an anchor being deployed. It's unsheathed and this exposes the flat trail. This is the delivery catheter riding over the flat trail. And now we obtain an orthogonal projection of the IPS so that we can see exactly the depth that it's exiting. This is the needle being unsheathed. And then you pull back the system and you'll see how it straightens. And then as it's being pushed across the dura, this is the device being delivered. And then because it's still attached to the uh, shroud, you can actually pull it back and tug it. And this is the microcatheter retrieving the anchor. Uh, this is the final uh, view of the uh, device in position. You can actually place two devices, one on each side, and uh, you can also retrieve the device. How would you do that? Uh, well, uh, you, initially we used um, kind of a stent retriever to, to snag onto the proximal uh, portion of the device, simply because we had them available uh, as neurointerventionalists, but um, they're not indicated for such use. And so you can actually use a simple snare. And so you can use a snare you borrow from our body uh, colleague, body interventionalist. You can see the snare here being used twice in biplane. You can finally snag the proximal device and then pull it. This is what it looks like when it's pulled. And you can see the dura here because it is kind of uh, quite uh, thick and uh, it, you know, effectively remains intact. So our next step uh, was actually to identify um, a way to begin um, the testing of this device. Um, and um, that's where uh, you know, my friendship with uh, Pedro Lilic, who uh, uh, unfortunately wasn't able to give this talk today. Uh, Pedro trained at UCLA, so we have that UCSF, UCLA kind of competition, um, but uh, he's uh, been a great friend. Um, and um, he's really been uh, at the forefront of many technologies um, and uh, really been at the first in human and many of uh, the devices that now are saving lives. And uh, we were lucky to visit him uh, down in Buenos Aires and um, actually have him come and visit us. This is uh, Pedro down below um, trying the device uh, up here in Boston. And so our initial thought is uh, what would be the best uh, patient population uh, to have this um, e-shunt um, contribute uh, to their care in an equipoise manner. In other words, we cannot offer a device that although minimally invasive and has potential advantages to patient population where we then have to add additional procedures such as lumbar puncture or ventricular drains to confirm that it's working or to put it in a patient uh, population where um, the risk of the device, which is uh, still unproven, uh, would be higher than the standard of care, which is the VP shunt. And so we felt that uh, patients with uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage um, that had already undergone a ventricular uh, drain placement, on the, you know, right frontal usually, uh, when uh, they come in and then turn out to actually be shunt dependent, usually will then undergo placement of the VP shunt many times. Um, on the left side, and you know, we thought that the patient, um, uh, you know, consented. This would be a bit of an equipoise, um, and although the CSF would be bloody tinged um, and contain a high protein content from the initial hemorrhage, um, that um, you know, this would be a relatively uh, minimally invasive procedure. Uh, to help avoid um, placement of, of a VP shunt and a, a patient who's already had a ventricular catheter. Um, the other advantage of this uh, patient population is they already have a external ventricular drain in position. And so it would enable us to uh, document and actually verify that this 
concept actually works. We, we have no, um, you know, we, we were hopeful that it would work, but we had no proof that the concept would actually um, work. Uh, and the best way to, uh, to find that out is to determine whether there will be any change in the intracranial pressure uh, of the catheter that's still in position uh, after we put the, uh, the device. Usually when we place a VP shunt, um, and we uh, remove the ventricular drain right after the procedure in the OR. Uh, in this case, the plan was to place the e shunt and then keep the EVD in place for up to 36 hours um, to confirm uh, and measure the ICP before uh, pulling out the uh, ventricular drain. So this was the ETCHA study, uh, which is still ongoing. Um, and uh, so the primary endpoint is that 30, at 36 to 48 hours following Ishan placement and with the EVD clamp, uh, ICP measurements that remain below 20 centimeters of water um, for uh, periods um, that they basically be no longer than 15 minutes where it will be above 20 centimeters of water. Uh, the safety at 24 months for any device or procedure related uh, complications and also at 24 months, uh, evaluate the need for an actual alternate CSF diversion such as VP shunting. Um, so <clears throat> this is the whole team uh, from Buenos Aires with uh, Dr. Lilik uh, and Yvonne uh, Lilik um, and uh, Carlos um, and uh, Pedro Lilik Jr. visiting um, us uh, in Boston, uh, practicing on the loading of the device and the deployment. And uh, this is when um, actually COVID hit at the same time and that complicated our, our uh, first trial. The initial um, concept was that we would fly down to Argentina and actually uh, work with the team there and help them uh, with the first patient. So that was no longer a possibility. Uh, but uh, thanks to Zoom and video conferencing and becoming uh, additionally uh, kind of facile at it, um, our first uh, in human came at a time where we were all in disparate places. This is Carl who was on vacation in the Caribbean. I was in Boston and the team uh, obviously uh, in Argentina. Um, and this is our first patient, an 84 year old woman uh, with a ruptured MCA aneurysm that was treated by coiling um, and uh, had a ventricular uh, drain place for communicating hydrocephalus. And actually she failed the clamp test with our ICP going up to 38 centimeters of water. This is the MCA aneurysm after coiling. And this is the clamp test that was performed. Uh, and you can see it spiked up to 38, was then reopened again. And um, the patient was then in, basically selected after uh, screening of all the images uh, for being the first patient. The EBD here was closed, as you can see, and then there's an increase, uh, progressive increase in the uh, pressure, uh, and I will show you the procedure in a second. This is the uh, pre-screening MR. You can see that there's sufficient depth of the CP angle cistern on both sides, and the IPS on multiplanar reconstruction was found to be uh, sufficiently uh, large uh, to accommodate the delivery catheter. This is the critical part uh, then, is to really uh, image the uh, IPS in relationship to uh, both the vertebral artery and its branches, um, ICA and uh, making sure that uh, there's sufficient distance. In this particular case, we use segmentation and, you know, using uh, Amira, which is a program we use in, in the lab to segment the IPS here in purple, the arteries uh, in bright red and the brainstem. Uh, there are other uh, techniques for imaging and uh, we are working on a kind of a unified uh, low effort uh, approach to do this visualization portion. But this is exactly where the IPS kind of makes the turn. It's right above the jugular tubercle that you want to plan the exit of the device. And uh, it's uh, part of the design of the device. It's called the straight shot approach, which is basically as that uh, turn is being made, when you pull out the, uh, the unsheet the needle and pull back the system, you'll see the needle straightens and that makes the, uh, the uh, angle of the force that you're applying straight and enables you to safely control the depth of the penetration of the CP angle cistern. If you're too far, then the uh, system will simply skive along the IPS and will not be able to um, 
have the transdural uh, penetration. This is the procedure, uh, initial portion here as the team is uh, uh, getting access into the uh, IJ with a guide catheter and then getting into position. Uh, this is the initial imaging showing the IPS cavernous sinus. This is the six French gut catheter and the micro catheter now is in the uh, uh, cavernous sinus. And uh, at this point, a three-dimensional run is obtained after the roadmap. This is the anchor being deployed after that 3D map roadmap has been done. You can see this, the, uh, the anchor has proximal and distal markers. You wanna make sure that the proximal marker is sufficiently distal so that the delivery catheter doesn't bump into it. And this is the part where you are planning the penetration site on the 3D roadmap. You draw the circle. And this is a Philips unit. We uh, did a lot of our development work on the Siemens unit, but it's universal. Uh, you know, any machine that has 3D road mapping will enable this. <clears throat> this is then transferred to the workstation. And so now with the overlay of the fluoroscopy, you can see this is our target site. Uh, apologize about the quality of the imaging, uh, but that then enables us to see that this is where we'd like to exit. And um, this takes us to the next step of the procedure. So at this point, uh, just to, for guidance, this is the IJ, the IPS, the cavernous sinus, the stent anchor has already been deployed. And then the flat rail is uh, coming all the way out of the guide catheter. And now we've actually, uh, or Dr. Lilik has advanced the delivery catheter over the flat rail. And uh, now is advancing the system up to the target. Then it will be unsheathed. This is now being unsheathed, thereby exposing the needle that you see right here. And then you can see there's still a bit of a curvature, so he's actually going to pull back until the system straightens. And you can actually see the needle straighten up to give you that straight, straight shot approach. When those markers are aligned, that tells you that the actual needle has been completely exposed. And now you can see how the system has straightened up. And this enables then very controlled advancement into the CP angle cistern. And you can see the tip of the needle now is across the IPS. And this is the advantage of having the IPS in the bony uh, channel and fixed. And actually here, you'll see that Dr. Lilik did a, a run. This is the very first time that you actually transgress into the central nervous system to see whether there's actually any contrast extravasation into the CP angle cistern. And um, you can see there wasn't any. Uh, with the needle in place, then the eshant is advanced through the needle. And then you'll see as it enters the CP angle cistern, the malacot's going to open up. This is the tip of the malacot and the proximal portion of the malacot. You can see the needle. It's just about to exit. And you can see it right there now, the outline. And that's a sure sign that's exited. It's kind of that's the tip of the needle. And now the using a stabilizing action on the Ishant um, shroud, you basically keep it and stabilize it as you withdraw the needle and the delivery catheter. You see the needle now is outside uh, of the CP angle cistern and has been pulled out. This is the proximal portion. It's just been released by the shroud. You can see how it clicked. And uh, the Ishant is now in position. Um, this was the patient's ICP um, overnight. You can see that actually decreased. And in the morning, 
uh, we were all very excited to see that the ICP had gone down uh, with six millimeters of mercury. This is with the EVD remaining clamped and remaining in the patient. Um, this is the um, uh, comb beam CT showing the location of the device as we expect uh, right outside the uh, IPS into the CP angle cistern. This is a conventional CT. You can visualize the malacot. Um, and this is the trend following the Ishant insertion. You can see that uh, dropped precipitously and then kind of uh, hunted around and basically remained below 15 centimeters of water at the 36 hours, which means that it uh, met the uh, primary endpoint. You can also see that there are some spikes in the tracing. This is uh, as you would expect with uh, having a ventricular uh, drain in place. Uh, when there's a vapor chain, the patient may be being turned around. This is a drum dallenberg position when the central line was changed. The post-procedural imaging showed the, the ventricular size uh, decreasing. Uh, this is uh, just contrast enhancement because the patient also had the treatment uh, for vasospasm at the same setting before the Ishan placement. The MR, you can actually see the um, kind of the artifact from the uh, Malakot uh, right outside the IPS. Um, you can actually even see the on NPR um, the actual body of the Ishan with the sled valve uh, in the IJ. An additional four patients have um, undergone treatment um, and all four have also met the primary endpoint. You can see that their uh, pressures actually um, went down, uh, enabling removal of the um, EVD. So in conclusion, um, CP angle to IPS, um, CSF shunting is feasible uh, and decreases ICP and has been successfully performed in five patients so far. Um, it can be safely performed uh, using image guidance. Um, if you step back and think about it, this is the very first percutaneous endovascular transluminal access into the central nervous system. Um, in addition to uh, treatment of hydrocephalus, it opens up, uh, has implications you know, for uh, use as an access platform for, for gene therapy, uh, antisense oligonucleotide, possibly stem cell injection, and um, Thinking about it a um, bit more of an abstraction as really a access platform for performing um, percutaneous neurosurgery uh, through a, through a um, percutaneous uh, approach, effectively using it as a port to access into the central nervous system. Uh, the Ishan placement is stable and can be visualized using CT and MRI. Uh, the results are pre preliminary and we are at the beginning of clinical validation. Um, and uh, one of the other um, disease entities that we would like to consider is treatment of other communicating hydrocephalus, potentially such as normal pressure hydrocephalus <clears throat> in pH, um, and uh, obviously idiopathic intracranial uh, hypertension, which also can respond very nicely to venous stenting, um, may potentially be a candidate for this uh, technique as well. Uh, and pH, as you know, uh, affects um, a large uh, portion of the aging population and has uh, really significant uh, kind of uh, public health um, implications. Um, and uh, we are uh, beginning on a trial, uh, both with Dr. Lilik in Argentina and uh, a uh, small uh, IDE uh, that has just been recently approved uh, by the FDA uh, in the US. Um, so um, I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to present uh, this uh, exciting but also, um, you know, novel approach. Um, and, um, you know, please thank you. Uh, open up for questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very, so much, Dr. Malik. It was fantastic. We're watching here with the fellows. I mean, we really, we really admire the fact that you even try to do this. Uh, I mean, to develop this technology is it's amazing. And uh, Dr. McDowell, you want to say something before the questions? Yes. I do. I mean, just what an exciting story. I mean, it is, it is you know, one of these tales of perseverance. And I and, uh, really uh, admire what your work and what you've done. And just the, uh, it is pretty bold uh, to make that leap yeah, into the first human patient. I can imagine uh, 
a lot of breath holding there when you're first puncturing the dura in that in that first patient. So, um, but it, but it is a really exciting idea, um, and and I, I'm wondering uh, about the. I mean, I think it's a perfect patient population that you're trying it in the the subarachnoid patients. Uh, the questions that I think that people will be wondering is, you know, how do you uh, interrogate this over the longer term to, you know, when there's questions of, of uh, headaches or, you know, other than in, enlarging ventricles on, on um, CT scans, you know, whether to interrogate whether it's functioning properly or partially failing or, or clotting. And then the other question I would ask, uh, just sort of off the top of my head, is is um, NPH the use case scenario? Because uh, I, I don't understand the, the pressure gradient there as much. Um, it may not be as great. I'm just wondering about that. Yes, I think uh, those are both great questions, uh, um, Cameron. And I think you know, for shunt malfunction, you know, this is a very simple device. You know, it doesn't have any pressure sensor or any telemetry or any flow sensor or any such. Um, and I think you pose an excellent point. Uh, I think we're going to have to treat it like you would with a uh, VP shunt malfunction. Um, unlike the VP shunt, you know, you won't be able to do a shunt app, um, but you know, it will entail obviously interpretation of the imaging and the lumbar puncture. Um, another um, piece of data that I did not have uh, a chance to show you is that uh, uh, Pedro actually did cisternography and was able to show contrast flowing through the eshunt in one of the patients. Uh, but nice. in, in another patient, uh, that was not possible. Um, and so we, we did not actually see the flow through. Um, and if you think about the, the construction of the device, it's really kind of like a valve. Um, and so it will only work or be open when there's a high gradient. So it will potentially be flowing intermittently and when the pressure uh, drops below that cracking pressure, it, it may not actually be open. Uh, <clears throat> so that's a very good question. Uh, and I think it definitely is a limitation of the device. Um, and um, I would say it will have to be evaluated uh, with a combination of lumbar puncture and imaging uh, with cisternography being a, a possible distant third approach. Um, one of the uh, advantages uh, and uh, Again, in one of the f uh, five patients uh, had a, an infection um, and we were actually able to successfully remove the device uh, without a complication. And so <clears throat> uh, we don't have long-term uh, data, so we don't know if it's possible to remove the device safely six months out, uh, but certainly in, in the case of an infection or if it's no longer functional, um, removing the device is, is feasible. Um, when it comes to MPH, I, I, I share uh, your concern as well. Uh, we are balancing, you know, on the one hand, the clinical need. You know, a lot of these patients are much older, and uh, you know, we as neurosurgeons always hesitate to offer, um, you know, VP shunt. Although it's a straightforward procedure, as we get older, it, it's tolerated less well, and a lot of these patients have complications. So we think, uh, from a clinical point, uh, it would be uh, helpful patient population to uh, offer a minimally invasive or less invasive endovascular approach that hopefully would have a shorter recovery rate. But I agree completely with you. Um, the simple name of it, NPH, normal pressure hydrocephalus, you know, uh, entails that the pressures are not going to be very high. Uh, and the concern is, are the pressures uh, differential lower than the cracking pressure of our valve so that uh, in fact, I mean, the valve may not be open at all versus are there variation during the day where there's enough um, of a gradient to enable enough drainage to have this effect. And then you go to the fact that the regular VP shunt because of the hydrostatic pressure differential when the patient stands up enables further drainage. And I know one of the complications when the pH is over drainage, but could they be getting a benefit from the conventional VP shunt by those transient over drainage events, which make it work even in the case of uh, you know, of, of having a low pressure. So all these are very good questions. Balancing that is the fact that the CSF in those patients will not be uh, filled with blood products like they are in the subarachnoid patients. Uh, the fact that they are have much more favorable uh, large cisterns where 
uh, targeting uh, will be more straightforward and may not require as uh, high-end uh, three-dimensional reconstruction and, and planning. Um, and so those are the kind of the pros and cons, but I agree with you, it is very possible that it may, it may not work in that patient population. I really like the use case scenario for the uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. I mean, there's no need for antiplatelets if you, you know, as you do with a stent, there's the, the finickiness of shunts, the lumbar peritoneal shunts and all that, and the slit ventricles and all those things. And those, so I, I think that's, that's an intriguing use case. Has, have you had a chance to look uh, in any of those patients to see if that subarachnoid space is, is too compressed to, to use the device yeah. in that situation? <clears throat> That's a great question, um, Cameron. And uh, I have to say, we have not systematically looked at that. Um, you know, we've looked at a few and say, oh, this one would be a great candidate, others not so much. As you know, a lot of these patients are younger, and, and so I think we'll have to do a more systematic analysis. Uh, but I agree with you, it would be a, a great uh, first step. Um, and, you know, if we believe in that kind of uh, vicious cycle where the elevated pressure causes the herniation of uh, the arachnoid granulations or potentially stenosis of the, of the, of the sinuses, then breaking that cycle with, a, with an eShunt may, may be very helpful. Uh, also in the NPH population, um, or even the IH, um, I guess the device could be seen also not just as a therapeutic, but potentially diagnostic uh, tool at some point. You know, a lot of the patients that come in with NPH, if we get to a point where the device may have some utility, then it could be basically placed as a diagnostic tool instead of kind of putting the, right. putting the patient, doing all the, you know, high volume taps or potentially a ventricular drain um, and potentially be removed or, or kept in place. But it, we're still very early, and I think you're raising some excellent points in terms of the long-term durability and the fact that we still don't fully understand the dynamic aspect of uh, CSF um, you know, flow and, and pressure regulation. We think we have an understanding, but there's a whole dynamic component to it um, that um, maybe uh, you know, with multiple order um, kind of dynamic components that we're altering when we place the shunt. And so... Uh, we still don't know how placing the shunt will, will will have an effect in the long run. Well, it's super exciting work and just just an incredible uh, genius innovation. Really, uh, oh. really thanks for sharing it. Thank Matthias, you. I'll, I'll uh, turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Doctor Mike. Uh, first question from my side. We know that the subarachnoid, like the cisterns, are compartmentalized. So, do we think the CP the CP angle cistern is going to be re representative of the? CSF dynamics of the rest of the brain? Well, I mean, you would hope that um, the CSF, uh, this is again for communicating hydrocephalus. So, um, you know, uh, uh, we, we hope that, you know, when we actually get into the cistern itself and we're not simply uh, outside the, 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 you know, the subarachnoid space, um, that it would be um, communicating. We know that. The, Placing the shunt in those patients, the five patients, did lead to decrease in the ICP through the ventricle or uh, catheter. Um, but uh, there may be cases of loculations or uh, incomplete communication where you know we may not um, be, uh, you know, it may not be functional. Uh, yeah, is there any way to, to do a cisternography once the needle is deployed? Can you do a cisternography, like? That at the moment? That's, a, that's an excellent point. Um, the current design of the device um, has, uh, through the lumen, uh, a shroud, which is a micro stand that holds the device. And so the resistance to actually advance contrast and then pull back CSF is, is relatively high. Uh, but, you know, we kind of compromise on the smaller size to, to enable the largest use of, uh, you know, the largest patient population we can treat. Um, there's no reason why that may not be possible. Um, in fact, um, if you don't have the eShunt loaded, that same approach with this device gets you in. Uh, you could potentially use a smaller needle to do cisternography, uh, to do, um, you know, obviously injection of any other therapeutic device, uh, TPA potentially, uh, you know, uh, and even treatment of vasospasm. So there's many opportunities uh, if, if it's shown to be a safe access route uh, consistently, you know, and looking at the risk benefit down the line. Do you have any special considerations regarding the 
anti-aggregation preoperatively after the shunt? Yeah, so uh, the way that, um, you know, uh, after we discussed it with um, Dr. Lilly's group <clears throat> is the patient will be anticoagulated during the procedure and then um, given a protamine dose just before the puncture. Um, my sense of the safety of the puncture, honestly, is uh, I would hope, at least for my patients, this would be a great um, patient population is all the patients on dual antiplatelets that are undergoing uh, stent coiling or potentially flood ever or for like a blister aneurysm or, you know, uh, I, I don't foresee that dual antiplatelets as being a uh, high risk. Uh, but again, we don't know. It's a good question. Okay. Is there is there any way to modify the opening pressure of the patient or is it gonna be a free flow? The opening pressure of the valve. Uh, so um, it is a laser cut design right now. And so you have a variability within it. It is uh, possible by making a potentially bigger slit or other modifications to, to change it up and down. Uh, we kind of targeted the general use, uh, you know, kind of training about 10 ml per hour in, in, with a gradient about five centimeters of water, uh, sorry, 10 centimeters of water, but they, they could, you know, that could be modified as well. Okay, one of my colleagues here, Dr. Somchi has a question. Hi, we thank you again for your presentation. You know, we, we're we amazed. This is really, I mean, potentially revolutionary. Yeah, thank you. Um, what about this idea of accessing other cisterns? Could you come through the superior sagittal sinus and access the interhemispheric fissure? Um, is this yeah. conceptually conceptually possible? Yeah, I mean, you know, our initial uh, patent was basically to go through any sinus, you know, so the superior sagittal sinus would be an, an option. Uh, the concern there is you kind of have to make a space, right? You have to make a, a space. So we kind of envision maybe having some kind of a, a uh, little ampulla that would kind of stand that would kind of keep a space so that the brain wouldn't simply collapse over the ishant. Uh, those are all possible uh, applications, you know. Um, and, you know, there are, we've thought about the idea of actually potentially traveling, you know, with the right imaging tools, um, you know, whether OCT or IVIS, you know, is it possible to perform a, a you know, third uh, ventriculoscopy from below? Um, you know, is that another option for treatment of even obstructive hydrocephalus? So uh, we're still kind of thinking, but, um, you know, I think the convergence of, um, you know, uh, improved imaging tools, uh, fusion techniques, 3D road mapping, and coupled with uh, local high resolution imaging. I don't know if you saw the recent paper by um, Matt Goodness and his group with high frequency OCT. If you combine the two, there may be opportunities to kind of um, expand uh, what our our field can offer to patients in the future. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Malek, are there any concerns of a lower cranial nerve damage with a needle around the IPS? That's a very good question. So now one of the things you need to consider is the uh, trajectory. You know, we we're initially concerned about hitting the sixth nerve, um, but when you look at the trajectory, uh, it actually is not, the vector is not towards the sixth nerve. And you really, you want to limit the depth uh, to less than, uh, you know, uh, six, uh, five millimeters or so. And so that's kind of where a lot of the pretreatment, you know, imaging is going to come in. Um, and so that's why I kind of, we really need to stress the fact that um, this is, it's kind of, you know, imagine the initial uh, aneurysm treatment, you know, with the first GDC coil, you know, you were kind of limiting it to large, you know, aneurysm that couldn't be treated surgically. You know, even in my training, we kind of didn't treat two millimeter aneurysms or smaller, <clears throat> but now, you know, with the right microcatheter, the right uh, imaging, the right uh, stable approach, you can treat aneurysms that are small one and a half millimeters, you know, and so I think we have to, uh, be very careful and cautious and uh, do all of the, you know, the proper imaging technique. And then I think um, just like with treating a small aneurysm, you know, if you're not careful and if you push, uh, you know, the envelope and, and, and you're not meticulous, you can definitely cause uh, injury. So uh, I think we, we have to be very careful, but uh, with the right uh, planning, with the right imaging, planning your trajectory, um, you know, uh, we know that it, it can be done. Uh, safely. Um, so. Okay. Do, do you think it? I mean, it's just it's just a thought. Maybe for obstructive hydrocephalus, you could do an ETV and in an ishant. 
I mean, in theory. Yes. Uh, yes, that's uh, yes, that's possible. I mean, I, you know, as with all things, I mean, um, you, you can't predict the future. Uh, and, you know, like with endovascular techniques, just with flow diverters, you know, um, when you first see, you know, when I first saw the first full diverter, I'm like, yeah, this is not going to work. And then you're proven wrong. Um, and similarly, other devices that should work never really work. And so there's this aspect in, in the body's response to devices that we can't predict. And the real winning devices are the ones that seem to perform way out of proportion uh, to what you'd expect, you know, like the stent retriever, you know, uh, with a soft clot. I mean, you probably can, it worked in great in 85% of, of, of cases. Um, and yet it was right there in front of us. We kind of never thought about it. And, and so this could be one way or another, or it could be somewhere in the middle. So it's difficult to be sure. Yeah. Oh. I have no more questions, but uh, Dr. McDowell, any final remarks? Again, I just want to say thanks so much for sharing this with us. Uh, it's exciting work. We look forward to uh, to its development and wish you every success with it. Yeah. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. We're um, we're still in the middle of it, and um, you know we really appreciate all your support. So thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. We'll be watching with interest. Thanks. Thanks again. Bye bye now.